But I don't see running ever leaving my life again unless physically I can't do it. Because the joy I get out of it, whether I'm with somebody or by myself, is too profound to let go now. After all those years of not really doing it when maybe I should have, it's, it's a great, great return of an old friend. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you for joining me for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. I really, really appreciate you giving the time to talk to, with me today. Last week, I talked to Bobby Phillips, who shared what it is like as a runner living in India and why Boston Marathon is a dream come true for most runners, even in other countries around the world. If you've not already listened, make sure you go back and check it out after this interview, of course. Often when I prepare for these interviews, I have certain things about the guests that I think you would like to learn about. It's usually some kind of aspect of their life that I've learned about and stands out, or something that they are known for. After reading the book, My Year of Running Dangerously, which was written by my guest today, I had way too many questions that I wanted to ask. However, our interview ended up barely answering any of the questions I had. But instead, we talked about something much more valuable and something you're really going to resonate with. I really think you're going to love what he has to say. And if you don't finish this interview feeling like you want to go put on your running shoes, then I'm not sure what could ignite your love of running. Unless, of course, you're listening to this while you're running, then maybe you might not want to go back out there. But otherwise, I'm pretty sure it's going to work for you. So who is my guest today? Well, his name is Tom Foreman. He is an Emmy Award winning journalist. He's been a journalist for over 30 years. He's an anchor and a reporter for CNN. And most importantly, he's friends with Meb. Now you have to like him, right? (laughs) Today, Tom and I are going to talk about why skipping a run because you cannot fit it in is okay, but you should never skip a run because you just don't want to. How to make sure running makes you a better person rather than allowing it to turn you into a bad relative, bad friend or bad person. And how to challenge yourself while still being realistic with your training. So before we meet Tom, I just wanted to let you know that I have a brand new page that I created just for my podcast listeners. All you need to do is go to runnersconnect.net forward slash run to the top. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. And you'll be able to get access to everything podcast related. I thought it'd be really nice to have everything in one place. I would love if you would go check it out and let me know what you think. So are you ready for your perspective to change? Let's do it. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Tom. Nice to be here. It's nice to have you on, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some things, uh, what you got to say about uh, the book, and you will be able to tell, as many of my guests who have written books uh, have, that I have read the book thoroughly, and I've got some questions for you that I'm hoping you can answer, because sometimes my questions are so detailed that people can't even remember writing that specific section. So I'm going to test your own knowledge of your book a little bit here. I'm ready. (laughs) Okay. So your book, um, which is called My Year of Running Dangerously, which I will put links to and we'll talk about more as we go along. Um, You talk about taking up running after a long hiatus from running to uh, progressing to an ultra by the end of the uh, year. So could you kind of share a little brief synopsis of the story for listeners who may not have heard of it? The story began on a Thanksgiving when my older daughter, who was 18 at the time, uh, this was back in late 2010, uh, asked me if I would help her train for her first marathon. As she was going to the Georgia Institute of Technology studying aerospace engineering, she had just started, and she wants to be an astronaut and has for quite some time. So she knows that fitness is part of that, and she thought marathon training would be a good part of her fitness regimen. Well, I had not marathon since my 20s, and I had only run sporadically since then, so I really didn't know if this was something I could still do in my 50s, but the timing all seemed right for when she wanted to run this marathon in the spring. We had 16 weeks, which sort of fit a lot of marathon training programs, so I just jumped into it and thought it would be fun to try, and we progressed very well through the winter training. 
uh, ran the race, had a wonderful time. She did very well. And then because I had trained seriously for the first time in my life, really, I was having a wonderful time. And she and others said, why don't you just keep running? And the result was that year from almost a standing start, from that Thanksgiving to the next Thanksgiving, I ended up running four half marathons, three full marathons, my first 55-mile ultra marathon, and about 2,000 miles of training. Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was interesting to see you progress. And I was really impressed with, uh, you didn't really seem to have many injuries along the way, which most people who, like you did, kind of jump in headfirst for that training, uh, especially with the number of races that you just mentioned and the number of miles you put on your body. How do you think you were able to handle that considering you hadn't run in such a long time? Do you have any thoughts on what helped keep you healthy? I think, I, I think first of all, it's something that I have, I get no credit for. It's just the truth. I think I have good genetics for this. I, mm-hmm. I was a natural runner when I was young. I think that's helpful. Um, So I wasn't prone to having weaknesses in areas that are affected, particularly by running. Uh, But the other thing was, I took very seriously the idea of incremental increases. Even though it's a tremendous amount to build up in the course of a year, I was very careful about how I did it. I tried never to just jump out and overextend myself with any one run. One of the mantras we had, my daughter and I, was that, um, the run that counts is tomorrow's run, not today's run. Oh, I love that. And that you should never run so hard today that you make yourself unwilling or unable to run tomorrow. That's a great So we were point. very forward thinking that way. And the only, the only exception to that that I know of even to this day is a specific race. If you have a race that you really want to go do really well at and you have to lay it all out there for that race, but that's even a planned thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so so we we focused on that, and I took every hint of a problem seriously. In that, every time I felt the slightest little hitch in my stride, or tweak in a knee or an ankle or hip or something like that, I would almost instantly on the trail. I might stop and walk for a hundred feet or a half mile if it took it to make sure it worked out and settled down, because I didn't want to have a serious problem. And any time I came in and something felt a little achy, I would put a little extra effort into maybe massaging a little bit, maybe taking some aspirin, maybe you know running cold water over it in the shower or whatever, but to kind of calm down those joints and muscles. So I was very, very attentive to the possibility of getting injured because at my age, I knew that recovery would take much more time than I wanted to take. Mm-hmm. And how did you kind of come to that, like, wise decision of you know listening to your body because if I feel like most runners it takes a long time before you start to understand how, what it means to listen to your body and to have that like very wise way of looking at uh running how do, do you have any thoughts on how you kind of came across that or is it just you'd like followed running over the years or any other thoughts I, I think it's a little bit just a, an artifact of age mm-hmm. I think that uh, you know, I learned it through work and through my family and through my experiences throughout life that that a lot of things that you think you should just push through, very often the most valiant and smart thing you can do is to back up a little bit mm-hmm. and give it room because the goal, right, is always to get from here to there in the most efficient way possible. Absolutely. And And if that means going sideways for a while or stopping for a while, to get everything reset so you can continue on that way, then, then that's the thing to do. I think that one of the reasons I think that older um, runners often make better ultra runners than young people has nothing to do with the physical part of it. I think it really has to do with the mental part of it. But I think older runners sometimes are simply better at contemplating the long run. If you're going to run for 10 or 12 or 13 hours, I think they may be just a little bit better because of life experience in saying, I know what that means, and I'm not going to get too worked up if in the first six hours I'm a little off pace or something didn't go the way I expected it to. They're very calm about that Mm -hmm. because they have that sense of time. I think a lot of younger runners are impatient, and they want to get there a little bit too soon, and the result is they push uh They push too hard. And to me, the other thing is, I don't know how to explain this other than I feel like now 
I can much more clearly feel the difference between discomfort and injury. Hmm. And, and, you know, I can have discomfort in a given joint or in a muscle, but I can tell that it's just fatigue or a buildup of lactic acid or I gave it a little tweak. But it's very different than when I feel something that I think is an actual injury. And in fact, I had earlier this year the first what felt like an actual injury to me in quite some time in that I was out running with my daughter, who uh, the one who got me started on all this, Veronica, Ronnie, she goes by. And we were on a trail and I caught a toe on a rock and I sort of yanked my leg as I started to fall. And I felt it sort of uh, grab something on the outside bands of my knee mm-hmm. on, on, the, on both sides. And it felt strange enough over a series of test runs over the next week and a half or so, including a half marathon, that I then backed completely off running except for my heavy racing schedule of the fall, which was very, very heavy. But I backed off all everything else because at that point I thought what I need right now is recovery because I can run with fatigue. I can let my ba- I can let my base erode a little bit because my base is strong enough, and I'll still be fine. What I can't do is let this injury turn into a serious injury. Absolutely, that's really good advice, and I think uh, you know all of us can kind of take something from that. I think a lot of the time. I, I've been kind of encouraging this a lot on my personal blog is um, that it's, you know, in your heart, like whether you're sick or whether you, you know, something hurts. If you take the time to look and listen, you know, in your heart, whether it's something that's serious or whether it's just one of those random pains that hits you for a few strides and then it's gone, you, you know, in your heart. And I think that's probably where you've kind of got to the point that you can listen to that voice of yours and like you said I think a lot of it is age because of your age you've been able to you know you're wise wise of the world and things so that's well, interesting. And you have to and you have to be honest with what you feel mm-hmm. I think that's the other thing that's hard to do if you're preparing for a big race and you have and particularly I think when you're younger and you still have more speed on your side because I don't have that much speed on my side now I can run fast for me, Mm -hmm. but I'm never going to be really fast again. But nonetheless, there are races that I will train for, and I have some idea in my mind of what I'm going to do. I know it's really, really hard if you're suddenly six days away from the race and you feel something odd. It's really hard to say, okay, I need to adjust my expectations for that race. Mm -hmm. Because what you want to say is, no, 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 I'll just run through it. I'll be fine. (laughs) Yep. And and I think that it's I think it's even harder when you're young and you have the capability of delivering such great results. It's hard to say, wow, I just trained, you know, sixteen weeks or whatever, twenty weeks for a marathon, and now I'm two weeks out and suddenly my goal of, you know, three hours or three fifteen or whatever it is you're aiming for suddenly is melting in front of me because I've got a, a hitch in my right ankle. Yep. And you want to run through it. But my argument, kind of like my the run next day is what matters, not today. I would say, ask yourself how valuable that race is to you. Yeah. Because if that race is going to cost you the next six months of running, then then how, how much does it matter? Absolutely. And aren't you better off to just sort of take it easy, get through it, feel okay, and regroup? Mm-hmm. Because that's the, and, and again, ultra running is a great lesson in that because ultra running is about good miles, bad miles, doesn't matter. Just keep stacking the miles and just mm-hmm. keep moving mm-hmm. and moving smartly and you'll get to the finish. Mm-hmm. So would you say that running an ultra is kind of almost an analogy for, you know, a training segment because you have those, you know, good workouts, you have those bad workouts, as in the good miles and the bad miles within an ultra. You're going to get little things that are going to go wrong, which of course you always will, especially in like marathon training. And, you know, there's lots of ups and downs. Would you, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it just kind of seemed to me. No, like it what does you make said. sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. You know, something interesting, uh, years ago, I spent a day with the great animator Chuck Jones, the guy who created Bugs Bunny. Mm-hmm. And he was 85 years old, wonderful guy. He still would do like 10 or 12 drawings a day of just little cartoons that he would draw. And he said when he was 17 years old, he went to art school. And the art instructor walked in the first day and said, each of you has 10,000 bad drawings in you. 
The sooner we get them out, the better. So let's start drawing. <laughs> I love that. Well, I know at my age, and I know for every runner, we all have a ton of bad runs in us. You know, days where we just go out and it, it doesn't feel right. You feel clunky. You feel tired. You feel slow. Your muscles feel tight. There are a million things out there that are going to add up into a lot of bad days of running. Mm -hmm. But those days are just as essential as your good days of running because they, they help you learn to work through those problems a little bit and because they're just natural. I mean, nobody at anything has every day go perfectly. It's all about this mathematical theory of graduation toward the mean. There is some general way in which you run, some general level of performance. Some days you're going to be exceptional and you're going to run well above that. And you're going to feel like it's the greatest thing in the world. Mathematically, the next day, you are likely to not run as well. Mm -hmm. The same is true when you have a bad run, though. When you have a bad run, the next day you're much more likely to have a good run because that bad run is well below your average. So I welcome my bad runs the same way I do my good runs. Mm -hmm. When I have them, they're not as much fun. But in the end, I say, well, good, I got that out of the way. <laughs> what a so great maybe way tomorrow will be a better it. run. Yeah, well, I love and, that. And, that's, and that is, I will say, in ultra running, one of the great lessons of ultra running is you go through so many mood swings. Mm -hmm. At least you do at my level. If I, if I were a great ultra runner, I guess I wouldn't. But for those of us who, most of us who are, you know, struggling with that kind of monumental distance, there are those moments when, you know, everything just feels like, wow, I don't know why I'm out here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I'm trying to do this because I'm so tired. And I, I talk about it in my, in my book as being, you know, you're in sort of the big empty and you go into the pain caves and you're thinking, well, I don't know why I'm doing this. Yeah. Well, you, you learn through ultra running to sort of ride out those cycles a little bit more. Because you may be feeling very, very bad, like you can't go anymore. And then a couple miles later, you may feel, if not good, at least a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that really instructive for people trying any of these things. Because I will say this, I know this to be true. The best athlete out there, the best runner out there, still has painful, awful days. Oh, absolutely. And what makes them good is they accept that that's just a painful, awful day. It's not the definition of their ability or their limits. It's just a bad day. Mm -hmm. So let's go to next day and see if it's better. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And uh, and actually, I, I've talked about that quite a lot on the podcast. Uh, being an elite runner myself, you know, people think I often run along like happy, you know, oh, this is so fun and this is so good and I love this. But a lot of the time it's not. It's the, the grind and the, you know, Drudging my well, way through that everyone too. does. <laughs> well, that hurts too. I mean, people yeah, look at, at elite runners and they think, oh, you know, the weird thing is they look at elite runners and they think, aren't they amazing? And, and the second thing that they don't say is they make it look so easy. Mm -hmm. It must be easy for them. And I'm like, it's not easy for them. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've become friends with uh, Med Kofleski. Yeah. And Med talks about how, you know, a, a, a big race, a big challenge where you're trying to do these great things. It hurts, oh, yeah. and it's difficult, and it's painful, yep. and that is something that I think unites all of us, whether you're an elite runner at the front or you're a back of the packer, and that's why I have, frankly, that's why I have so much respect for, you know, a few people out there struggling through their first 5K, yeah. and they're really struggling, and it's, and it's hard, and they're running really, really slowly, and they're, and they're in agony. But I'm just like, you know what? I have tremendous respect for that because I know you completing that 5K today may be just as hard as me completing 15 miles. Absolutely. Maybe harder. And I respect that because that's what it's all about because we're all running our own race. And as I said to Meb one time, we were talking about the New York City race. And I said, Meb, there are 50,000 people running. One of you gets to win. Mm -hmm. The rest of us have to run for something else. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know? Well, actually, that kind of leads on well to uh, the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which was you had a quote in there that said, uh, no matter how much you may want to run a marathon for someone else, part of it, maybe the biggest part has to be for you. And I just kind of wanted you to first tell us like what made you realize that and if you could explain that a little more, because I think a lot of people get tangled up in that web of doing it for other people. But at the end of the day, like you said, you know, with Meb, he's maybe the winner or someone else will be the winner, but everyone else is doing it, should be doing it for them. Yeah, because I think that, that you have to, I, I think, frankly, it's just too long of a race 
to sustain this notion of, oh, I'm, I'm doing it to impress somebody else or I'm doing it for some other reason. I, I think when you run that long and you expend that kind of effort, I think there has to be a, a, almost a Zen-like quality in you that says, I am out here to deliver the best I can to engage the physics of this race as a human animal and deliver the best I can. Mm -hmm. And the real joy of this does not come from the middle or from my finish time or from where I am in relation to everybody else. Although all of those things matter and all of those things are challenging and exciting. The real goal of it is to reach that, that beautiful state of, I just ran a beautiful race mm -hmm. and I expressed you know, my, my human athleticism the best way I could. Yeah. And in that regard, to me, I mean, I don't mean to get all sappy about it, but to me, that starts feeling a lot like art. Yeah. It becomes something really special that transcends mere exercise. There's something really beautiful about that to me. And I, can, I have had races where I have not run my fastest race, but they have been beautiful races, and I feel great about them. And I've had other races that I've run very, very quickly for me that have not been beautiful races because I didn't deliver them beautifully. Mm -hmm. But when it all comes together, oh, man, what a great feeling that is. Yeah. I mean, you, you come streaking across the line and you feel fresh and fast and wonderful. And it feels to me at those moments like you're like you're really part of what the running experience is about. And I frankly, I think what makes so many of us love running. Yeah. You know, that feeling of sometimes I could throw the watch away. And sometimes I could forget about the terrain and sometimes I could forget about everything because honestly, it makes you feel like you're six years old and you're just running again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the um, the trap that a lot of runners fall into is when they're uh, out running, uh, when they have a race coming up and they put too much pressure on it, thinking I've got to run this or I've got to run that. That's often A, when they don't run as well as they should and B, they don't enjoy it as much because... You know, you're not doing it for the reason you should be doing it to feel, like you said, like that six-year-old running where you're just out there for the joy of it. You're out there, but instead you're out there because you feel like you need to do this or you have to do that. So I loved how you uh, described that there. And I think even if a non-runner is listening, or I'm sure there are somewhere, maybe my family, some non-runners listening, uh, I bet you made them even want to give running a go. That's a, I love the way you just described that there. So speaking of that, um, you know, we as runners and you especially talking about it in the book, uh, we put ourselves in many situations that non-runners, you know, think we're, we're crazy. And it sounds like the most miserable thing we could ever do, let alone like choose to do it. So, you, you know, I'm thinking of uh, you talked about um, a story about uh, running eight miles in the snow. Uh, towards the beginning of your training and your wife Linda you know kind of said oh you know why do you have to do this and you were like no and you took it as a challenge and you know you did it anyway or tried to do it um, but it seems like everyone who's not a runner kind of puts themselves in that situation where they see us as crazy until they become runners themselves so you said that what you were just talking about before is obviously one of the reasons that you think running is so special. Do you have some other theory, other things that you think are absolutely beautiful as well uh, about running that we could uh, talk about? Well, one of, them, one of them is I think something that every runner gets to understand, which is that just time out, time outdoors matters. Yeah, I mean, it really does matter. And it sounds like the simplest thing, and I think most of us have heard it from the time we were little, but in this day and time, and particularly as you start getting a little bit older and, you know, you have kids and you have a job and you do whatever it is you're doing with your life, it's really easy to look back on your days. If you're not running or doing something like that, it's really easy to, to go through whole days where you realize you were never effectively outside. Like you went outside maybe for 20 steps to get into a car. And then you're in the car and then you pull into a garage at work and then you go up to your office mm -hmm. and you're there inside all day. And then you get back in the car and you go back home and you go 20 steps into the house and maybe you go to a restaurant. But suddenly you start realizing, I lived an entire day <laughs> inside something. Yeah. And I just find that it's a very awakening experience to be outside. And frankly, the extremes of weather are, I, I, it just makes me feel remarkably alive to be exposed to those things. And one of the other rules that we had uh, well, when we were running with Ronnie and I, as I said, you know what, here's, here's a good rule of thumb for training. If your schedule is such 
that you really can't run someday. And sometimes that happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. There are family, work, whatever. You can't run that day. If you really can't run, but you want to, it's okay if you have to skip that run. The run you can't skip is the day that you just don't want to. Hmm. That's when I'm like, no, no, no. That's when you have to go. Because you can't give in to that little part of you that says, let me just retreat back indoors. and Let me just stay warm. And let me not go out and engage the world. Because it, you're always better off. I mean, I, the worst yeah. days I have, I always feel better once I get out there and move a little bit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it takes a mile and sometimes it takes five miles before I feel better. But invariably, I feel better. And that engaging of the elements, the other thing is, good gracious, you know, you get to see things that in all fairness, other people don't get to see. Yeah. You get to watch, you know, sunrise over the river with the fog pouring in and you turn your headlamp on because you've already done your five miles on the trail and the woods are filled with just mystery and beauty and things that, yes, you could get up and go out in there and do that in the morning, but you know what? You're not going to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you go for a run, you will. Yeah. And you get to see, I mean, I've, I've just seen beautiful things and I've experienced wonderful moments where I just stop in the woods uh, there's one point I describe in the book running on a very, very cold, frozen night down this trail that, that in that kind of weather, nobody goes down. So I'm in the middle of millions of people here, but I may as well have been in the Yukon because mm-hmm. it was as if nobody was anywhere. And to stop in the middle of that and look up and see the stars and and feel the cold and sort of biting at your, your hands and your face and know that it's not really threatening you. But it's it, it just, to me, I, I mean, I know this sounds very, you know, sort of, a, a, I don't know, very meditative, but it, it is to me because I spend that time to daydream and to think about other things and to feel back in contact with something that doesn't involve me being in the perfect temperature all the time and the perfect setting where a fresh cup of water and a chocolate chip cookie is just arm's length away. I kind of like not having that. Mm-hmm. And it, it reminds me of, of the, the bigger human experience which is part of what I love about running. Yeah, yeah. Especially as we live our life, like you said, in such comfortable positions all the time and everything is, we're really not forced into discomfort that we, you know, most of our lives, we never get that, you know, that that feeling. And I think that's why running brings such a rush when you cross that finish line knowing you've given your all because for everything else in your life, you, you know, you want something, you go buy it. Or you need some, you get, you know, like you said, you get cold, you turn on the heat, you get warm, you turn on the air conditioning. Like, I think you're right, running is one of those things where you actually get to work for it and it brings that sense of accomplishment. So, well, I think it's part, and I think it's also part of our genetics. And the reason yeah. I say that is because years ago I had a, uh, a, a friend many years ago who was a sculptor. And I did a lot of, you know, drawing and painting and things. And he said, and I played music and everything else. And he really encouraged me to fiddle around with sculpture for a while. I never became crazy about sculpture, but I understood one thing he told me about it that was really worthwhile. He said, you're doing so many things in your head. You need to do some things that are in your hands. You need to physically engage things. Running physically engages you, no matter how else you want to do it. And so much of our lives, especially now, and good gracious, how much of your day is now spent staring at some sort of screen mm-hmm. with images or words on it and relating to that and then maybe talking to somebody about it? But physically, we're not, unless you're in a profession that requires you to be physical, like being an electrician or a plumber or a, a carpenter or something, many, many, many of us spend all of our time in our heads. And I think that there is something to be said that, you know, throughout uh, uh, evolution and genetics, We are not so far removed from the time when our survival depended on physical effort that we can stop having physical effort now and still feel healthy. I think there's something in us that craves physical effort. Mm -hmm. And running is about the best, quickest, most efficient form of getting physical effort into your life. Definitely. For many of us that I can think of. Definitely. Very, I, I'm loving this discussion so far. This is really intriguing. And I think uh, a lot of the listeners will be kind of nodding their head along to this. This is, you know, really getting well, us to think and look outside the box. This is unlike any of the other interviews I've had so far. So this is great. Well, 
Well, I'm not fast, so I have to be thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have more to offer than you think. I mean, there's a lot. Well, actually, let's kind of talk about that for a minute. Um, I want to go back in a minute and kind of ask you about, you know, how you fit it in with your job. But um, something that kind of struck me in the book, which I should mention now, I guess I will put a link to the show notes in uh, for the book, which is my year of running dangerously at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC85. Um, you talked about how you it took you a while, and I don't know if you still feel this way because you brought it up even towards the end, about not feeling like a runner and how you know you kept struggling with feeling that you weren't a real athlete. Um, and I think a lot of runners feel that way. So how did you kind of get yourself out of that mindset? Or maybe you're still struggling with it, and how do you kind of combat that when you do? I'm not sure. That I, well, well I, I'll say this. Here's what I think about the word athlete. I think athlete, this is a variation on a thing I heard many years ago. I think athlete is a gift word. I think it is something that people can say about you, but you probably shouldn't say about yourself. Okay. In that it is a recognition of your performance level. So I still don't call myself an athlete. You know why? Because I know people like you, and I know people like Meb, and I know people who are real athletes, and I am so in awe of their accomplishments that I say, I'm not, I'm not going to elevate myself to say I'm an athlete. Now, if somebody else wants to say it about me, I will be very gracious and grateful for them doing so, because I consider it a huge compliment. But I, don't, but I also don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it now because I've stacked up enough miles. I've done enough things that are at the limits of what I think I'm physically capable of that, you know, uh, I don't, I don't really spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not I'm a runner. I'm very sympathetic to people who struggle with that because I will say on any given day, even now, you know, just in the past, you know, not this fall, I've run five marathons in five days. That's a pretty good bit of running. Yeah. But even in that, there were moments when I'm like, oh, I don't know. Am I really up to this? Am I just fooling myself? Am I really this kind of a runner? And um, in the end, I think that people have to be both hard on themselves and that you need to challenge yourself to be better. You need to push yourself to improve and to feel strong in what you're doing because there are those difficult days where the only way you're going to get through is pushing yourself through. But I also think we have to be in a weird way, gentle with ourselves. You can't mentally beat up on yourself all the time mm -hmm. with some sense of, oh, who am I kidding? I'm not this, I'm not that. It's like, well, frankly, who cares? Just go run and see how you feel. And don't worry about whether or not you think of yourself as a, a great runner. I'm, I'm delighted when I run well. I'm delighted when I finish well in my age group. Um, and I still entertain notions in my head of bigger accomplishments in running. But if I don't get them, that doesn't remove the joy and the excitement and the success of what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, my, I mean, in all fairness, at my age, my great days, my great opportunities for great running um, are well behind me. But, but in fairness, I'm running better now than I ever have in my life. Yeah. Whether or not the clock shows it or the medals show it or the finish standings show it, well, so what? I know it. And it feels really good. So mm -hmm. I know people wrestle with that, but, but that's, I, I just think it's really important to not worry a whole heck of a lot about what anybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. I think you have to, I think you have to think about what your family and your workplace thinks in the sense that you need to make sure that your running is a positive experience for everyone, including them. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, I often say to young runners, work as hard at your life as you do at your running. Because people need that in your life. And you know, Ronnie says in the book at one point, she says, the challenge is not running a marathon. The challenge is running a marathon without your life falling apart. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And I think that's true. And I think that's true for most of it. It is different. Again, when you start talking about elite athletes where this is actually their profession, that's different. But for, for most of us, I, I say work as hard at your life. Make sure that your workplace sees your running as something that makes you a better employee, that your family sees your running as something that makes you a better family member. Because if you just go out and lay it all out there and then spend all Saturday afternoon napping because you're gassed from having done a 20-mile trainer, 
Well, I understand that a family's representing that. So I, when I say don't worry about what other people think, I, I think don't worry about whether people think you're a runner or what they think about your running. If you worry about anything, make sure that they know you're a good member of a family, a good person at work, a good person to know as a friend, mm-hmm. and that running makes you better. Yeah, that's great advice and, and very important, something that isn't really talked about enough. You know, we we do, when we get, I know I can be guilty of it, when we get it well into that training segment, we can kind of, you know, become a bit selfish. And, you know, you talked in the book about your life became work, running and sleeping. And, you know, you struggled with that for a little while. So um, it was you know, it's a good reminder that we, like you said, we do need to make sure that we have a life outside of running and you don't tie everything to it. Um, So then what advice do you have for people? I mean, you're in a very demanding job. Um, You know, you talked about being called into work a few times and, you know, you talked about struggling with uh, your relationships uh, at times as well. But how, what advice do you have for people who either say they do not have time or for people who are struggling to see how they can kind of keep that balance within having a life and, you know, maybe they have young kids or they have some kind of other scenario that won't allow them. How do you, how do you fit that in? Well, it's harder when you have kids. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I don't, some, some types of training I think are, I think are very hard to fit in. I think marathon training when you have young children, if you're being an attentive parent is very hard to do because you know, the, just the sheer time commitment, especially if you have a job that's also demanding. And frankly, who doesn't have a demanding job these days? And that's kind of how jobs are now. So I think that that's very hard to fit in. So I think that people, uh, it's helpful if people are realistic up front while challenging themselves. They say, okay, what reasonably can I take on Yeah. without, without stressing everything to the limits? It's also fine I think it's really good to inform people, to let people really know what you're dealing with. I think my wife has been very understanding about things when I make clear to her what I'm doing. If I say, I think I'm going to run, um, you know, like when I was doing these five marathons in a row, okay, I'm going to do, or this fall I also did uh, the Chicago Marathon, the Marine Corps Marathon, and the New York Marathon. If I tell her that, she now knows kind of the cycle. And I'm able to say, I want to do this this fall. Do you see any reason why we can't do that? And if she were to say, well, you know, we've got this huge family event, we've got this and this and this, then I may have to adjust my schedule mm-hmm. to, to make it not be a problem. But that also allows it to be targeted. She also knows that when I hit the end of a big cycle, that I will give back. I'm not going to hit the end of the cycle and then say, hey, you know what? Now I think I'll do this. It's like, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. You made a promise. You have a sense of what you're doing. So now cycle down a little bit, make your running schedule lighter and easier. Give everyone a break, spend a little more time just doing the things that you do as a decent friend or family member, you know, going to movies and going shopping and doing whatever it is you do so that everybody gets a break. And again, everyone sees the positive. It, it just can't be, I mean, this is true of anything, honestly. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, whether you, if you play music or if you, golf or you, you know, uh, you, you like, uh, you know, playing poker with your friends or something, whatever it is, if you let it run away with you, people are going to resent it. And, and by the way, this business of people having time for running in general, I think everyone has time. Now I, I, I shouldn't say everyone, cause I'm sure there's some people whose schedules truly are too overwhelming, but an awful lot of us who think we're very busy. You know, we're not as busy as we think we are. Mm-hmm. We've got, yes, we have a lot committed, but you know, even for a moderate runner, if you wanted to knock out two or three miles, if you wanted, if you wanted to not knock out just three miles a day, just five days a week, what is that, less than a half an hour a day? Mm-hmm. Even with the cool down, you're only going to be 40 minutes. Yeah. And if you're not wasting 40 minutes in your day, well, you're an unusual animal because almost every day, I know, waste a lot more than that. <laughs> I don't mean waste or waste it, but you, know, you spend yeah. time just doing the stuff we do. That yeah. You look around the clock and realize an hour and a half has passed. Definitely. Um, And then just so you did mention about, you know, when it comes to fitting it in, you talked about getting up uh, early to do your runs. How early are we talking here? Just so you can kind of. Oh, for, well, for a period of time during, during the heaviest, heaviest training for the ultra, I don't know. I probably, I don't know, 4.30, something like that, maybe. 
Okay. But I didn't know a lot of that. I'm not a really good morning yeah. person. Mm-hmm. I, I only did that, again, for a targeted period of time. Yeah. Well, this, this fall, because of all the running I've been doing, I've been doing, I've been getting up, oh, some mornings earlier than I would really like to, which means I'm, you know, up at 5.30 or something and out the door. But I, again, I haven't done that much. I mean, my mileage has been so high in my racing, I guess. Mm-hmm. Not all this racing, it's just long running. My mileage has been so high this fall that lately all I'm doing is racing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not training at all right now because I've, I'm stacking up. As, as we speak right now, I've had, oh gosh, uh more than 200 miles in the past, I don't know, four weeks. Wow. <laughs> which, which, isn't, which isn't huge, but it, so I mean, it's not huge, right? but, but well, to have the five stacked five yeah. in five days, that was 130 miles, 131 yeah. miles in five days. So that, you know, to get off the backside of that and try to recover for a few days and then get ready for the New York City Marathon. And then, you know, so right now that's, that's the thing for me to do. So it's, it's kind of weird for me to, to calculate it right now. I do know people, I met a guy at a race recently who routinely gets up at four in the morning to run. And I thought, wow, that's really, that's going, man. <laughs> well, that's good. And that uh, just kind of puts it in perspective. And uh, to go back to what you were saying about, um, you know, the family and putting them as a priority and, you know, other things. I love what you said right there. And I think all of us can learn something from that about, um you know, how a marathon can kind of take over your life. We all become a little obsessed or whatever race it is you're training for. But when that's done, then like you said, you step back. And then you said about, um, you know, you talked a lot about Ronnie, uh, uh, your daughter who got you started in running again. And then, uh, you know, she said at one point uh, you were her hero, which was really sweet to read. And I'm sure that's one of your uh, greatest moments. But uh, can you just kind of tell us about what it was like, you know, training with your daughter? I'm sure most runners kind of imagine a moment where they would be able to run with their kids. And just tell us, like, how special that was to be able to train with your daughter for such a big race. No, oh, it was it was fantastic. It was unbelievable. And it, I, I honestly didn't know she could do it in part because, I mean, good gracious, she's going to Georgia Tech. So it's one of the toughest schools in the world. Studying aerospace engineering, one of the <laughs> toughest things to study. And I really, when she launched this idea, I thought, well, you know, mm-hmm. we'll see. I, I think we might end up running for a couple of weeks and she may say, I really can't do it anymore. Uh, I was so impressed that she stayed in there and kept doing it because it's, it's, she's 18 at the time. And you know, you know, I mean, good gracious, you're kind of marathoning, you know, the dedication it takes to yeah. marathon at any level. And I think when you're really young, it's, it's, easier to launch into such an idea, harder to see it through. And so it was a very, it was a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And to this day, it's, you know, I really like, we talk about this question of, do you think of yourself as a runner? I love the fact that she thinks of herself as a runner. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel so good because she has set herself up for a lifetime. Yeah of running and running constructively. I think she's done 15 half marathons now. She did uh, the Atlanta race, made the marathon down to the Public Georgia Marathon, and she just did the New York City Marathon with oh. me, which was her first New York Marathon. And and she said after New York was over, she said, hmm, I hate that this was over because it was so fun to work toward it. <laughs> and she said, I think maybe I'll just try to marathon maybe once a year. Yeah. And I said, that's a very reasonable thing to do. Yeah. And if you can, great. If your work becomes too much that you can't, that's fine too. Because the marathon, as you know, is a is a it's demanding in a way that half marathons are not. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, you can go out and kind of at, at my level, you can go out and kind of fake your way through a half marathon anytime, and you'll be kind of okay. Harder to do with yeah, the marathon, oh, yeah. <laughs> much harder. And then, of course, the ultra marathons is a little bit off the charts. You don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> um, but but it was a wonderful feeling, and I'm so. I'm so happy that she has this sense of identity about herself with running that makes her stronger in every way, in every way. And you know, in in our society, in this day and times, the challenges that young women face are different than the challenges for young men. And this makes her a stronger young woman. Mm -hmm. And she's, and she understands in a different way than she did before what it means to grapple with really big things. And and so, of course, running talk permeates 
much of our chatter mm-hmm. when we're talking about, you know, she has a big exam at school and she's like, oh, well, this and this and this. And we'll often revert to, well, you know what it's like at 18 mm-hmm. miles. Yeah. You're at 18 miles. You're not really at the finish line yet. Oh, yeah. But you better tend to business because your race is going to be decided in some ways between 18 and 22 miles. Definitely. Now, it's different. It's different with the kind of racing you're doing where you've got the people who are fighting down to that last. But for many, many, many people, you better have teed it up properly because before you head into that last four miles, if you haven't set it up properly, you're not going to get it back there. Yeah. You need to be in the right position, in the right frame of mind, with the right fuel burn and everything to finish well. So we, we have that kind of conversation about everything these days. No, oh, yeah. Running is a great analogy for life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, I, w- I don't want to share it. I want to, uh, people to read the book to find out about why uh, when Ronnie admitted uh, the reason she started running in the first place, which I absolutely love. Um, but I, I would recommend people... One of the reasons people should read the book is it's really great to read read why she did uh, start running. But just before we uh, kind of end up here, because I don't want to hold too much of your time, do you have any advice for parents who want to kind of run with their children um, and they want them to try running, but they you know don't want to be forceful? Um, do you think there is it was it is it only really the situation like with you and Ronnie where Ronnie came up to you, or is there a situation where you can kind of push them towards it a little bit? I think I think you know there's nothing nothing more valuable than example. Yeah. Go out and do it yourself. Yeah. Show that you enjoy it. Express why you enjoy it. Yeah. You know, I don't think it does any good if you come in every day groaning about how miserable it is. <laughs> but I also think, but I also think if you show the, this great joy in what's fun about it. I mean, I mean, maybe I'm like a kid in this regard, but I think it's a blast when the weather is just dreadful outside to say, well, I'm going running. Uh-huh. And I think there's something about that that captivates the imagination of all sorts of people, but particularly kids. That sense of, what, well, dad's going running? Mom's like a going superhero running? superhero kind of thing. Yeah, 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 right. And so you get out there and you do that. And when you come in and you've got, and you're telling <laughs> stories, but, oh my gosh, it was great out there. When I was on the trail, you know, the snow was falling and I saw a fox run across the trail and, oh, it was great. The more you do that, I think that example mm-hmm. makes this an attractive thing mm-hmm. and said to people, well, yes, I get exercise out of it. Yes, I get more fit out of it. But this isn't about this isn't about agony. You know, this is this is look at it, look at it this way. If you played music and you said to somebody, "Go sit at the piano and practice your scales," of course they're not going to love music mm-hmm. because yes, those are the building blocks of music. But who wants to do that? <laughs> but if you sit down and you start playing, take the A train, and it's got zip to it. And it's going, and you're having fun. Then people want to play, mm-hmm. and I think that that the best thing you can do if you want to do this is lead by example. And when you go out to do it, remember that the first step is to make it a pleasant experience, mm-hmm. which means visiting and talking, and not not beating the drum of well, you're not running fast enough, mm-hmm. or you're not doing this. Like, look, if they want to walk for a while, walk for a while. Who's that going to hurt? Mm-hmm. In truth, in truth, with rare exceptions, as you would know, with very rare exceptions, most of us are not threatening to go to the Olympics. Some of you are. God bless you. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. <laughs> but most of us are not. And so for us, it's, it's a notion of, look, this should be a pleasant experience. You know what? If you started running with your daughter tomorrow and your daughter, and you find out that she really wants to go out for three miles, but she wants to walk the middle mile and a half, but in that middle mile and a half, if she talks to you and she tells you things about her life and you build a relationship mm-hmm. around that, then this is great running. Yeah. This is great running. Yeah. You can get around the miles later yeah. and the miles will come because people will love the experience. If you go out there and you try to pound this notion of, oh, we have to run this fast or we have to do this or we have to do this, forget it. You're doomed. Mm-hmm. You're doomed. Your child is doomed. Your whole relationship based on that is doomed. But running is not that. Running is, you know, this beautiful moment of filling your heads with oxygen and your 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 movement and, and you know, and, and, and this joy of the world and joy of each other. And when you do that, I think it resembles play a lot more than it does work. And who doesn't want to play? Yeah. 
But especially when people, um, you know, often say that they feel very disconnected to their children and, you know, they, they're just pushing them away. I think what you're saying right there is, you know, the perfect example of you'd be able to get close to them, you know, how they want to do it. But either way, you're still going to be able to have that moment with them and that closeness with them that you talked about. So. That's, yeah, uh, and it, it can be such a it can be such a fulfilling experience, mm-hmm. and it's so much fun. And now I run with my younger daughter. Not as much. My younger daughter hasn't embraced it as much, but now she's talking about doing her first half. Mm. And when she comes home, she often likes running with me. And my wife and I run together now. Oh, and great. I don't think my wife and younger daughter will ever. I don't think they're ever going to embrace running quite the way that my older daughter has. But so what? Yeah, they embrace it to the degree they want to, and yeah. we have fun together. And and it doesn't trouble my wife. You know, for a while, I think it troubled her when we would go out, or my younger daughter when we'd go out and we'd run two miles, because they'd be like, well, you could run 50 miles today. And I was like, well, I suppose that's true. But if I were with Meb, Meb could leave me so I couldn't even see him in a heartbeat. But he wouldn't if we were out to be friends. Yeah. If we were out to be friends, he would make time, and so what? This is it. We're all going to have a good time. And, and benefit from this. And uh, the experience has been a wonderful thing. And I don't know how long I will continue doing this sort of monumental mileage. I, maybe not for a long, long time because I'm not sure how well I'll hold up. Or, you know, there are other things I like doing too. I like painting. I like playing piano. So I may do some more of that and maybe some more writing and maybe a little less running. But I don't see running ever leaving my life again mm-hmm. unless physically I can't do it. Because the joy I get out of it, whether I'm with somebody or by myself, is too profound to let go now. After all those years of not really doing it when maybe I should have, it's it's a great, great return of an old friend. Oh, I love that. I love that. What a way to finish up. That's you are. This has just been so insightful and just I, I've loved everything you've said. This has been great. And actually, it didn't end up going kind of in the direction that I thought it would. But this has been so much better. And I think um, you've really kind of opened my eyes and made others think. So um, what would be the best way for people to kind of follow along with you and keep up to date with you? Is there a favorite social media channel or how would you like people to kind of stay up to date with what you're doing? I'm, I can be found on Tom Foreman, that's with an E-F-O-R-E-M-A-N, like the great boxer, who follows me on Twitter, which is great. George Foreman <laughs> follows me, makes me laugh. Um, uh, so it's uh, Tom Foreman CNN on Facebook okay. or Tom Foreman CNN on Instagram and on Twitter as well. Okay. And okay. I really, I love connecting with runners and I love responding to runners. Okay. So anybody who wants to say anything anytime, I'm happy to respond. And and trust me, if they want to know, if they really want to know how to run, they need to talk to people like you because you really know how to run. <laughs> but but if they want to, uh, but I love talking to people about whatever they like to talk about. I mean, I, I find runners to be incredibly encouraging people and optimistic people, and it lifts me up to exchange notes with them about anything. So yeah, no, connect with me, send me notes. If I don't respond, it's not because I don't want to. It's just because I overlooked it and then send it again, and I'll respond the next time. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I will put links to those on the show notes in addition to where you can purchase the book, My Year of Running Dangerously by Tom Foreman, which is at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC85. So Tom, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolutely amazing interview and I've really enjoyed it and I'm sure our listeners have too. Um, I wish you the best of luck with the next uh, training endeavors you have and I'm sure we'll all be following along from now. No, oh, absolutely. This has been a real pleasure. And uh, and the same to you. Next time you're out here, give me a shot. We'll go for a run. Will do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, then. Well, that didn't go in the direction I expected, but I'm so glad it didn't. I feel like I just talked to the Buddha of running. What a profound way of thinking. I really hope you go buy the book. It will be a wonderful Christmas gift for the runner in your family. And then, of course, you can read it afterwards too, but don't tell them I said that. (laughs) I just want to remind you that you can also text me to receive further updates from Runners Connect. I know some people have been confused about how to sign up for our newsletter on the webpage, so all you need to do is text TINA, T-I-N-A, to 66866, and I will get that helpful information sent straight to you, through your email, of course. So until next time, have a great week.